Um, so welcome everyone. It's really great to see so many familiar faces and some new faces. Um, we are really glad to have all of these amazing minds with us at this table, this virtual table. Um, for those of, some of you may be familiar with STEM Teachers NYC. Uh, for those of you who are not, um, we are um, a small organization, but a very large community of STEM teachers in the New York and Tri-State area, and we are continuing to grow. Uh, we offer um, pedagogy-rich uh, uh, professional development workshops that are all developed and delivered by currently teaching classroom teachers. Um, we are very excited to be joined today on this teaching about climate change um, QA, um, very hopefully very interactive panel session um, by five of our veteran STEM teachers, um, NYC workshop leaders, as well as um, Matthew Pierce from the NASA Goddard Institute of Space Studies um, and the education department there. Um, he has vast experience with various types of education programs, and we're hoping he shares some of that with us, um, as well as Chris Kennedy, who is uh, leading the Urban Systems Lab at the New School. Um, Chris, by the way, was our old director. <laughs> Clap from Juliet. Um, so the way that we're going to um, move through the panel um, we will start um, with Matthew um, introducing himself and his work, um, and then Chris Kennedy would do the same. And then our workshop leaders, um, in a very strategic order, will share their um, lessons and units, um, year-long and school-wide approaches to teaching about climate change and sustainability um, in their own contexts. Um, and then, um, We'll thank you to those who have already offered questions um, through the survey in advance. So we'll be looking at those. Please make sure to drop any and all questions into the chat so we don't miss anything. Um, we are recording the session for folks if you'd like to, to go back to it. Um, and uh, we'll kind of save some time towards the end for more QA um, for folks on the call. So without further ado, um, Matthew, would you like to take a few moments to introduce yourself and your experience, your current work? Sure. Thank you so much. And hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Thumbs up? Yeah? Awesome. Um, pleasure to meet all of you today. And thank you for the invitation. I've, I've always admired your, your group and the amazing work that you do as, as teachers and coming together as a community to improve STEM and science education. Um, so, as mentioned, my name is Matt Pierce. Uh, a little bit about me, I've, I was in the classroom for over 20 years. I uh, predominantly taught in the sciences of biology, anatomy, physiology, chemistry, did some genetics and biotech work, um, opened up new schools out west and, and launched one of the first online high schools. Absolutely loved the opportunity of teaching and the daily opportunity that you have to make other people's lives better with every interaction you have and not a lot of people get to do that um but re really have always been a diehard uh science teacher at heart and really worked hard to create new and innovative opportunities and, and impacts with science education which is ultimately what led me to nasa surprisingly i was able to become a finalist in their educator candidates for the space program uh, and we've had three teachers uh, in space Joe Acaba and um, Barbara Morgan, Dodie Metcalf and Ricky Arnold and we, we work to support them in, in the efforts to improve STEM education. So my role now is I lead the NASA's education efforts at the Goddard Institute for Space Studies which is uh, very close to Teachers College um, in Columbia. We're at 112th and Broadway, ironically above Tom's restaurant, the Seinfeld Diner. So I always get a kick out of looking at that. And, but I also work on, on many agency efforts. And moving forward, I want you to consider me uh, an asset for you in, in whatever efforts you're trying to achieve in your classroom, whether you're looking for some cool NASA resources, 
which our portfolio is vast, but hard to digest efficiently. Um, if you're working on any environmental or climate change issues or have any innovative ideas how you want to bring teams together uh, to improve STEM education, I just consider me somebody on your team and, and happy to help. I, I was going to show a couple of slides just to give you some visuals about who we are and, and what I'm, I'm working on. So if I hopefully I'll get the screen share right here. Can you, uh, can you see a yeah. PowerPoint? Yes. Awesome. And so you're, I, I can never tell which one you're seeing. Are you seeing the presenter view or the, the we're, full, full no, view? we're seeing the full thing. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Um, so I'd like to start with this slide. You may have seen this before. This is a visualization from our scientific visualization studio that for me encapsulates a lot of what GISS or the Goddard Institute for Space Study does. And most of our scientists there are working uh, passionately to understand the drivers and impacts of climate change from the bottom of the ocean to the top of the atmosphere and all the variables they can address. Uh, in between from aerosols to fires to volcanoes to glacial ice, ice sheet melting and all the brilliant folks there study all those impacts either through remote sensing or ground through the mechanisms and then try to create formulas and algorithm, algorithms and computer code to understand what direction the climate is heading. Um, if you ever heard um, it's the warmest month or the warmest year on record a lot of our folks at GIS uh, contribute to those discussions uh, along with directly supporting the IPCC report. The uh, NASA has uh, a robust network of centers. We have over 10 core centers that were also connected very closely with many universities. We have a Space Act agreement with Columbia University. GIS was formed in the early days of the space race to figure out what how NASA and the country was going to respond to that and learn how to compete in space flight. And, and now we have a much bigger challenge and that's figuring out what we're going to do about climate change. Um, but when you work with us, we can tap you and your students into any of these various centers um, and subject matter experts. Let's say you're doing a unit on Mars and want to talk to one of the folks that's out and uh, working on the new rover called Perseverance. We have the infrastructure and capability to create an education program to be with one of those subject matter experts to talk to your students or, or your staff. Um, Goddard itself has five campuses. Our largest one is in Greenbelt, Maryland, where we built the James Webb Telescope. And you may have heard of the Hubble Telescope. We, uh, we built that as well. And we get a kick out of it. It was only built to run for three, three years. And, we're celebrating the 30th anniversary of that observatory. We have a launch facility um, on Wallops Island. We often work with teachers and schools and groups to launch sounding rockets and, and build CubeSats and collect payloads and where teachers can take those CubeSats back into the classroom and study the data retrieved from that. The best center, of course, is the Goddard Institute for Space Studies, in my opinion. Um, we have an independent validation verification facility in Virginia. These are all our software experts. And we also have the capability to do balloon launches out of our White Sands test facility. The Goddard Institute for Space Study primarily focuses on remote sensing of aerosols and clouds. So for example, if you wanna engage your students in climate change education, we have a lot of tools that would allow you to um, download satellite data, analyze it through programs such as uh, Panoply, which is a, a free program you can use to create visualizations and insights from that. We also have many groups working on global climate modeling and impacts, and, planet, and we also look at planetary climates. The lessons we're learning about Earth, we turn around and look out into the universe and try to find new, <clears throat> new habitable planets. Uh, our director is Dr. Gavin Schmidt, um, who is, if you haven't had a chance to listen to him talk, he does a lot of great talks around town and virtual talks. I strongly recommend you look at his TED talk. He, he has a, a great presentation uh, way of wrapping your head around what a climate model is and some of the work that goes into solving climate questions. I get a kick out of being a guest for a whole lot of reasons, but 
one thing that's neat, and I'm sure you know of John Dewey, he, uh, he used to live in that building. So it's a kick for me when I get to think about him working at NASA, trying to improve STEM education, and John Dewey used to walk those halls. So the NASA Office of Education, which we now call the Office of STEM Engagement due to some organizational restructuring, is to immerse the public in NASA's work, enhance STEM literacy, and inspire the next generation to explore. And we do that by getting the public to contribute um, to works, to NASA's work in exploration and discovery. One of the ways we do that is in a variety of internship pro programs. Specifically, and I hope you'll consider applying to this in the future, I run a program called the Climate Change Research Initiative. And this consists of <coughs> um, four teams, all looking at different uh, aspects of the study of climate change. It's a year-long program that is functionally a near-peer vertical team, meaning that in the fall I retain a, a STEM teacher and a graduate student to begin the development of a research project in the fall where they do some literature reviews and experimentation and formulate their research questions. In the spring, they come back, and this is on a, <clears throat> a part-time basis that works around everybody's schedule. They continue the research, but then um, we work with the teacher to develop integrative unit plans that they're putting into their classroom. And it, that unit plan should reflect a component of the research project while aligning with the NGSS and utilizing NASA education content and resources to do that. So we really want you and your students to engage in all our various platforms, which aren't always very intuitive or uh, accessible. So I spend a lot of time orienting our teachers to do that. In addition, we try to build a professional learning community around the teachers that is a, uh, to try and foster a STEM ecosystem of interest. And when we conclude the spring, we take a break, let everybody get back to finish their classes and close out for the summer. And then we add a high school and undergraduate to the team where um, everybody works very uh, aggressively to complete the program deliverables, which is a publishable research paper, a comprehensive PowerPoint of the research project and a scientific poster, both of which we go down to Goddard Space Flight Center and present to uh, all of our leadership and at our intern symposiums. We've had uh, Matt, I, I hate to interrupt, but it's uh, past 6.15. Oh, I'm going too long. Thank you. <laughs> so um, if you want to reach me real quick, just screenshot my email um, and feel free to reach out anytime and I'll be happy to work with you uh, in any way we can to support your, your teaching. Thank Thanks. you, Matthew. I really was hoping that you would share the climate um, change research initiative. Thanks for that. Thanks. Um, I'm going to hand over the talking stick to Chris Kennedy. Hi, everyone. Happy Earth Day. Happy, Happy Earth, Earth Day. Day. Hope you had a chance to go outside or at least take a deep breath in your window. <laughs> 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 um, so, so wonderful to see a lot of familiar faces. I used to be the program director at STEM Teachers NYC and now help out with the communications. Um, thanks to Yodana for organizing. And um, right now I'm working as a researcher at the Urban Systems Lab, which is a design and practice space at the New School University here in New York. Um, and for the last you know, four or five months now, I've been working a little bit on climate change research and um, modeling extreme weather and kind of looking carefully at um, projections of how urban spaces and cities um, will be impacted by a variety of factors such as heat waves, floods, uh, or storm events. Um, the lab itself is really focused on sort of envisioning what is a sustainable, resilient, and just city. And so we have a number of research teams, postdoctoral students, um, researchers from all over the world, really looking carefully at um, how do we actually develop um, a comprehensive understanding of climate um, and also livable cities. So I'll share with you some recent research and then also some new stuff that has been developed since uh, COVID emerged in New York City. So let me see if I can share my screen with y'all. Uh, 
Okay, so let's see if I can get a full view here. Okay, so I'm just going to show you a really quick tool that we've been developing over the last five years that could be useful in your classroom. Um, it's an interactive map that allows you to look um, at a variety of different data sets. And mostly we work with at the lab is publicly accessible data that comes from places like NASA or NOAA, the US Geological Service. And we use data visualizations, simulations, modeling, artificial intelligence to develop um, different kinds of models and understandings of the data. And so one thing that we've um, been working carefully on is an interactive map of New York City, um, in addition to 10 other cities around the world, um, to really look at some of these different factors and how they interact with each other. So um, the mapping platform is, is free and, and openly accessible online, um, nyc.urbansystemslab.com. And um, it looks a little bit like this. On the left-hand side, there are a series of different um, systems that we're looking at, social, technological, and ecological systems. And when I click on um, one of these tabs here, um, the data actually starts to manifest on the map and you're able to see some indicators of, for instance, where flooding might um, appear over the next 10 years. Um, it's where the green roofs are located all over the city, green spaces, but also to overlay that with information about population demographic data. So uh, understanding where the most um, you know, rich neighborhoods are, where the most um, low income communities are located. Um, and we can also break it down by ethnicity or race to really understand environmental justice issues, who is gonna be most vulnerable and impacted most um, by some of these uh, oncoming threats. Um, again, ranging from heat waves to um, flood events, especially here in New York City. Um, more recently, we have kind of shifted our focus to look specifically at the COVID crisis and how that's interacting um, with a variety of different climates um, and weather data. And so we have began to sort of map social vulnerability um, indicators um, across the city, including um, things like median income, how that relates to positive tests for COVID. Uh, so communities of color, where those are located in New York City, how that again relates to the same data set of uh, positive COVID cases. What we're finding is that um, low income and communities of color are impacted disproportionately um, by the crisis. And we're providing open source data and maps and visualizations like this for the city to use to perhaps pl plan um, in advance for um, emergency response. We're also starting to look at things like geolocated tweets. So um, one of the hypotheses we have is that more people are going outside to parks because they're stuck inside. Um, and so what we're doing is collecting weekly um, data dumps from, the, from an app called Tweety and then visualizing that on a map to really understand um, how social distancing is impacting uh, human behavior. And um, we're trying to think carefully about, um, especially over the next two or three months, as the temperatures increase, what's the likelihood of that interacting with a with a heat wave or increased temperatures, um, specifically communities that don't have access to air conditioning. If they're stuck inside more, will that increase mortality rates? Um, most deaths um, because of heat happen actually in the home. And so we're looking carefully at some of that stuff. We're also looking um, at the availability of testing kits. Um, who needs access to them? Where's the testing actually taking place? We're finding that it's mostly the South Bronx and the Queens that need the testing, but they're not actually getting access to it. We're also tracking electricity loads. So looking at how data is shifting in terms of home versus commercial energy use. Um, what we're finding is a, you know, a decline in um, commercial and industrial use of electricity and an increase in residential. Um, declining use of mass transit, which correlates directly to COVID uh, cases and occurrences. And so really our goal is to bring attention to and highlight um, the most vulnerable communities that are in being impacted the most, and really to think about what could be a resilience um, plan the city can implement to not only address this crisis, but future crises and how they would interact with um, climate related um, issues uh, moving forward. 
This is really amazing. Yeah, so I'll just, maybe I'll just leave it at that. Um, again, the, all the stuff that I'm showing is, is on our website. And um, if anybody wants um, specific access to the maps, the plots to play around with, or the data sets, do let me know. We have an open source GitHub that we use as well. Um, I think um, I was hoping folks would save their questions. Um, you might already be thinking about how you might either create new lessons or uh, material around what Matthew and um, Chris have already shared. Um, Martina had dropped one question in the chat for Chris about um, the vertical distribution. Um, how do these maps take vertical housing into account? The density may be vertically distributed before we move on. Yeah, so we've developed um, what we're calling a cellular automoto um, model. And so it's looking at um, the lots that are provided by the US Census kind of, um, and what we have to do is manually go in and shape them. So the researcher that's doing that is, has like a whole sort of program to break down census data track um, information and then adjusting for typology of buildings and like what kind of um, building it might be, multi-use, single story, things like that. And so it's not necessarily always incredibly accurate, but we try to get as close as we can to, to the data. Um, and a lot of it is developing artificial intelligence so that the computer model can just go in there and do it. But unfortunately, it requires a lot of computing cloud space that's super expensive. So that's the big limitation is getting access to the Amazon web servers, the supercomputers. Um, so it can cost $2,000 to run one model for an hour, <laughs> which gives us data for maybe like one borough. So that's one of the challenges we're facing. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Martina, for the question. Um, so our agenda, the flow of our agenda was to, to move into some classroom um, examples. Um, and we're going to start with uh, Juliette Greenoberg, who is a fourth grade science teacher and also a STEM Teachers NYC board member, among other things. Um, hey, everybody. Don't mind my wild desktop. <laughs> um, as Jadana said, um, my name is Juliet. I teach fourth grade science. Um, I am currently at the Chapman School on the other side. Um, and I want Someone to should mute there. Yeah, I'm getting a little bit of feedback. <clears throat> I, that seems better though. Perfect. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, what I do as far as um, sustainability and teaching about climate change in my classroom. Um, and I thought since we're in this sort of unique uh, time right now where we're doing distance learning, I would talk uh, a little bit about what I've been doing as far as uh, distance learning um, and teaching about these topics. Um, so uh, just um, wanted to bring this up. I have been doing a program with my students called Trout in the Classroom. I just want to bring up the website quickly. Um, and basically, through Trout in the Classroom, um, we raise trout. Um, we actually see fertilization, egg and sperm uh, in the classroom. We raise the trout to fingerlings, and then we release them um, in a body of water and talk a lot about the watershed um, that that body of water is a part of. Um, so. I really wanted to focus on different types of water pollution and how water pollution could be um, connected to climate change. So a lot of times when you have a fourth grader thinking about pollution, they're thinking about larger debris, um, you know, larger particulate matter that can be seen. So in order to address that, um, one of the distance learning um, things that we did was we did a, a distance virtual engineering design project um, where they thought about water and we've talked quite a bit about water being a habitat for our trout and uh, had them create with materials in their own homes um, water filters with the, with the purpose, um, with their goal being um, getting it as safe for the trout as possible. So this is of course really focusing on some of these larger contaminants. And so this um, really makes them realize that not all contaminants are 
able to be um, filtered by their homemade filters because some of the particles are too small, right? So this kind of leads into a discussion, something we actually did in the classroom before we left for COVID, um, which is talking about other ways that our trout habitats um, can be affected um, and that these are also technically types of pollution as well. And these pollute, these types of pollution can be exacerbated by global warming and climate change. So for this activity, um, they had to test four different water samples and they had to, to test ammonia concentration, pH, dissolved oxygen, and temperature of each water sample to determine uh, which one was uh, most appropriate for the health and well-being of the trout and then um, support uh, their uh, evidence with their reasoning in a CER. Um, and this, of course, understanding that things like ammonia concentration and uh, if the water is too acidic or basic or if there's not enough dissolved oxygen, that those are also forms of pollution um, that can be caused by global warming. So uh, this is just like a little sort of wrap up question that I asked the kids, how might water pollution affect brook trout? I think that pollution like garbage and trash might make the brook trout sick if they eat it. I also think that if there are chemicals in the water with the brook trout, they could get hurt from the chemicals and they could get something like an ammonia burn. So kind of just introducing to them that there are different types of pollution and understanding how, how we treat the environment um, also um, determines how healthy a habitat is for, for us and for other living things. Thank you, Julia. That's really, that's great. I think um, we are going to segue into Evie Alexander, who um, is going to share um, somewhat connected work with uh, microbial um, organisms that live in um, water ecosystems and how she shares that and how she's developed materials for um, students and adapted uh, research articles. How's your, how's your video, Evie? Um, it's, Okay, um, I'm sharing my screen. Can you see it? Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Yes? Okay, great. So hi, everybody. Um, I am Evie Alexander. And so what I did was um, I teach environmental science. And um, about four or five years ago, I came up with a a year long curriculum centered around pond microorganisms. So I'll just show you guys this first because this is the cool stuff. So my website is Science with Evie, um, this one right here with the rotifer. And one of the things I have on it is a microorganism classifier. And what I do is I have students go out um, in September, we go out to Central Park, we go out to Sterling Forest, um, and we collect different water samples from urban rural areas and we look at all the organisms inside of them and so the kids are learning about this tiny little ecosystem and they are looking at the changes um, in the population as that jar sits in the classroom over time and so you'll start to see like all of the worms you know they'll like grow cr like crazy and then they'll all die because they run out of oxygen and then you have the protists come out and then eventually you have nothing the whole thing collapse and so part of this is um, they, um, I asked them to identify the microorganisms. So this Instagram account is where they can find the videos and the pictures. For example, this one right here. Um, this is, I believe, a heliozoan and it is eating other stuff. And so this is just one of, a, one of the videos we took in class. And so the kids learn about ecosystem relationships through these microorganisms. Um, and so I built this classifier um, just so that you know they can figure out what the organism is without um, having to ask me all the time and so you just kind of follow this dichotomous tree and then you can figure out whatever it is that you found um, so that's on my website so the whole point of that is that once they're comfortable with these names of organisms and this model of the ecosystem they can then go to um, my journal database. Um, this is just a compilation of a bunch of scientific articles that I've read in the past, I don't know, 12, 15 years. And so I just put summaries up with, you know, lesson comments, like how I would teach this. And they are 
um, organized by NGSS, and so you can find whichever one you want. And what I do is um, I'll have students read about the ecosystem articles, um, and so they can find them here. And for the lower levels, each of these articles have a summary, and so it tells them like where to go to see figure this. Um, it you know kind of distills it down for them, so they don't actually have to read the whole thing. Um, and for the lesson comments for teachers. Um, it tells them like, you know, you want to read the abstract first or the intro is very interesting. And so these are all of the um, ecosystem or environmental science related articles. So having seen these microorganisms, it's a lot easier for students to be able to understand, for example, this one using ciliates is indicators. So normally you wouldn't know what a ciliate was, but after having seen these, you know what ciliates are and it just makes the articles much easier for them to digest and analyze and they're not like shell shocked by all the large words and then for student work at the end of the year all of my students um, will write a research project um, of whatever topic they choose that has to do with environmental science so this is my blog oralgrooves.com um, and this is one of the um, papers that my student um, wrote and she was looking into like food labeling um, because we were she was very interested in you know the impact of agriculture and the food industry and so this is what she settled on and I took her research paper and turned it into basically a blog post so that other kids can go and read it as well so that's that's what I got <laughs> that's great thank you Evie um, Juliet sure had a comment um, you can already see how to use some of this. Oh yeah, I was just saying that we talked about indicator species when we were talking about um, trout habitats, so I already see some connections. Um, I think we have next on the list is Chris Resch, sharing some of your work. Hi, yes, so uh, my name is Chris Resch. I teach at uh, Montgomery High School along with Glenn who will be uh, up next on the list to to introduce himself. Um, I I kind of wear two different hats at Montgomery. Um, I teach biology and I've been teaching that uh oh uh oh the timing <laughs> Give him did a I lose anybody? You did yes <laughs> I lost it. Oh no! Yeah. I looked over at the screen and all of a sudden everybody was just like in the same expression that it's like, oh no. Bunch of stone face. So where where did what was the last thing that everybody heard? You wear two hats. I wear two hats. Okay. So two hats. The first one is biology. I'm a biology teacher. Um and then the second one is I take, uh, I teach a course called ISTEM, which is sort of an engineering uh, based course. So I kind of picked two lessons um, and two sort of uh, projects from both of those courses to try and give a little bit of a, a comparison of how I incorporate climate change into biology and how I incorporate climate change into uh, this engineering course. Um, so the, to start with biology, um, one of the things, especially in NGSS, can everybody see my screen? Cool. So one of the things with NGSS that uh, is super important is this idea of looking at phenomena. Um, and it just so happens that our school has uh, access to Pivot. I know there was an earlier um, webinar about Pivot. So if you, if you have this, then you might be familiar with it. Um, and we kind of, we, we touch upon climate change in, in my bio classes kind of throughout the year. Um, you know, for example, with photosynthesis and how does that affect primary productivity or uh, temperature changes in the environment and how that affects metabolism rates in, <clears throat> in different organisms. Um, but to kind of go along with the theme of, of uh, microbiology and, and water like Juliet and uh, Evie were talking about, um, I decided to highlight this one. So this, this is one lab that we might start off with in our in my biology classes it is on um, pivot it is about ocean acidification so one big question that a lot of my students have is like what's the connection between biology and uh climate change like they know they kind of know that it affects it but they don't exactly know how 
or what the sort of connection is. Um, and so in this, I'll just run this quick demo. In this um, uh, lab on Pivot Interactive, uh, what they do is they kind of simulate what this process of ocean acidification looks like. So they start by burning a candle uh, and you can see they have a pH sensor and a carbon dioxide sensor that are measuring uh, what's going on in this fish tank over time. And they speed it up so you can see that the, there's the pH of the water is decreasing and the amount of carbon dioxide is increasing. And so we just kind of pose this question of well, why is it doing that? Why is it that when we're burning this candle, the water pH, we're actually seeing a change in pH of the water. Like what's going on there? What's the chemistry behind that? And then we switch to part two of this uh, Pivot Interactive, where they look at uh, a piece of coral. They actually add a piece of coral into the mix. So if I hit go, Right, so they have, again, the pH and the carbon dioxide levels that, are, that they're measuring. But because the coral is, is made of calcium carbonate, what ends up happening is the coral actually changes mass. So at one, part, at, at one point within this lab, they mass the coral beginning and at the ends. And you see an actual mass, a noticeable mass decrease in the coral. So then the next kind of question for the students that I asked them is, well, why do you think that happened? So, so we're, we're kind of using some of these pivot labs to um, introduce this idea of how increasing in carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere can affect uh, biological systems in the oceans. Um, and then this is followed up by a case study that we look at specifically with uh, pteropods. So pteropods are these little, they, they call them sea, sea butterflies or, um, and they're basically kind of like the Snickers bar of the ocean. Um, they are eaten by a lot of different organisms. And so what's, what's actually happening is uh, the pteropod populations, especially in the South Pacific are starting to decrease. So after reading a lot of articles about this population decrease, um, one thing that one can is this idea that gels of the pteropods are actually made of the same stuff as the corals. And so these shells begin to break down, those food sources begin to decrease, and then the kids end up reasoning, well, okay, if that decreases, then we have this effect on keystone species, the keystone species in this particular food web. Um, and so this would come on the heels, this, this sort of case study kind of comes on the heels of them uh, looking at a bunch of historical experiments to see what the actual purpose of, or not purpose, but what the importance of keystone species are in an ecosystem. Um, now the other hat, like I said, was um, I teach this sort of engineering course and so uh, in this course, we, the idea, at least the premise that I kind of approach it with is that the, the engineering projects that they do um, have some sort of sustainability environmental science connection with it. So one example of, of something that I've done with them, uh, I call it the Tesla Roadshow. Um, so after students have been looking at simple circuits, um, they have to design, they end up having to design a car that is um, just powered by a simple circuit, but the car needs to be fit certain parameters and it needs to be able to stop out of a particular distance um, on, a, on a particular track. So they has to go the fastest and stop at a, at a particular distance. And so this was one of the designs that my students came up with. And here's one of the, this is the student uh, testing one of their cars. So you can see kind of the track. And then that blue line that was at the end there. Uh, I missed it. But that blue line was at the end. That was the target they were trying to hit with it. 
And the two longer uh, blue pieces of tape that were on the floor um, was sort of the speed, the area where we were seeing how quickly the, the car could travel between those two. And so how we ended up connecting this to, um, to uh, global warming and carbon dioxide production um, is actually, it was, it was a little fortuitous this year. Uh, the New York Times, I thought I'd show this, um, posted a uh, emissions map. I don't know if anybody's seen this before, but it's really, really cool. It kind of reminded me of, Chris, your, your maps that uh, you were showing. Um, just this year, uh, carbon dioxide emissions in the U.S. were surpassed due to uh, vehicles uh, compared to energy production. So the New York Times put out this big map, and you can actually hover over different areas and look at total emissions since 1990, how they've trended, if they've gone up or down. Um, you could pick, you know, if you want to go to Milwaukee, you could pick Milwaukee or something. And then as you scroll down, they, they sort of break down all the data from the EPA. Um, and so our students kind of investigated, you know, why is that? So there's New York. Um, you know, why is that? Why is it that certain places are trending upwards versus trending downwards? Uh, and then they were challenged to come up with a sort of a math, a, a way of figuring out, okay, so now that these vehicles, vehicles sort of top the amounts of carbon dioxide, um, that's sort of the upper level. They're the ones that are polluting the most. Um, what would happen if, let's say, all seniors in Montgomery High School, instead of driving to school, walked or took the bus? or drove an electric vehicle. Sorry, so Glenn, had, I'm just gonna give you yeah. your six a second. What's that? I wanna make sure that Glenn and Brian have some time and that we have yeah. a couple of minutes. For this Brian. is the last one, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, so, um, so, this is, so these were just some student examples and they had to figure out the math and do, um, take into consideration all sorts of stuff like average distances and the amount of energy and carbon dioxide produced for cars and things like that. So those were kind of two different, two very different lessons for very different uh, courses. That's great, thank you. Um, I'm sorry to cut folks off, um, but I wanna make sure that um, Glenn has some time and um, Brian has some time. Glenn, take it away. Uh, hi everybody, I'm, I'm Glenn Stewart and like Chris said, I teach at Montgomery High School in New Jersey with him. Uh, I teach environmental science and it's a senior kind of capstone class. So I'm really lucky to get all of the kids that did all of that excellent work with Chris and then, and then they come to me. Um, so I do a lot of similar activities um, to what has already been done. Oh. oh, sorry, that was my fault. I, I do a lot of data things a little more rapid fire because my goal is not necessarily to get you know, CO2 causes climate change um, because we, we can get to that pretty quickly, but it's more how can we use climate change as a case study to develop these models about systems thinking. Uh, so my goal is, is to produce uh, or have the students produce models like panarchy, adaptive cycles, social ecological systems um, in, in terms of content. Um, but if you did want to see how we get there, I have a, a a ton of specific examples, but that's not really where I wanted to go with this because I think everybody else has done a great job covering that. Instead, I, I wanted to talk about kind of the, the email that I get and the conversation that I have a lot with my students. Um, and I think if you teach it uh, right, the students should have an existential crisis at some point. Um, so I, I'm just gonna share my screen so you can read this email with me. Um, can you see my screen? So uh, this was an email that I received maybe three or four weeks ago, like right before we left. So I don't really have a question right now, but I don't know looking into all this climate change data and research again and the effects and everything just really puts me in the mental WTF position like before. Like I've been sitting here for five minutes like wow yeah, this is something that's happening and it is driving me crazy. And there are people in this world that don't even believe it. Like, 
what are we supposed to do with that? How are we supposed to change people that don't want to change? Like I can see the evidence right there, but I feel some people that don't believe it are like, yeah, NASA and the government are lying for money and whatnot. And I don't have a good response to that. How do we refute that? Anyway, I'm annoyed, annoyed and mind boggled right now. Thanks for listening. So I, this is a conversation that I have a lot with students. Um, and my response has been to create a curriculum that brings in a lot of humanities pieces so that students can deal with this existential crisis and also uh, be able to have the tools to go back and, and have those conversations. So my response was, hey, I've been seeing the same stuff all year. Um, the second day of school, we, we read Allegory of the Cave, um, just so we have a common language for when this happens. Um, you know, I, I, I know what to do when I, when I have this conversation. So how do we deal with people that are still in the cave? Where are we in the adaptive cycle? How can we overthrow larger, slower systems? How can we leverage small, fast systems to create change? Um, you know, how do we really need people to believe in climate change to make sustainable systems? Or are there other variables that we can tweak along the way? Um, and what are some old mind and new mind solutions for climate change? And if you think that making more people believe in climate change will fix that, uh, is, is in my opinion, an old mind solution. I think there's ways around it. And her response was, whoa, this is kind of insane. And you could see the light bulbs going off and we've continued this conversation. Um, so to me, it's very important to bring in that humanities piece for these types of conversations that I, I have a lot of the time. Thanks. Thank you, Glenn. This is um, actually um, really a great way to segue into Brian's um, school-wide kind of approach. Um, we, we had come to this conversation, this virtual, virtual teaching about climate change table, um, wanting to hear questions in advance from teachers who might be joining us, but also thinking about um, questions and um, kind of the internal contextualization of what students are learning in your classrooms. And that came up in both cases from the teacher leaders here, but also from um, some of the teachers who responded asking things like, um, do, do teachers feel like their students are thinking about climate change and discussing it um, in other ways with family and peers and how are they um, internalizing it and feeling about it? Um, before we we'll get back to that question but um in this sort of like comprehensive internal and external view i'll hand it over to brian as our last panelist oh is he not there anymore i see you oh one second Well, mic is on and video is working, um, but maybe we can stay on that question when he comes back. Um, it looks like he froze up. Okay, that's fine, that happens. We're all used to that by now. Um, so maybe we can return a little bit to that conversation. And I remember specifically actually Juliet, um, the fourth grader's perspective, um, if you would share that. Yeah, so to piggyback off of what Glenn was saying about this you know, existential crisis that you have when you really understand what's going on with climate change and this existential dread, um, then how do you uh, deal with that with younger students, right? So Glenn works with high school students, um, but when you have younger students, um, you know, it's still scary for older students, but it's especially scary for younger students who feel like they don't have as much control. Um, so, um, I used to work with Brian, uh, at Poly Prep. We both, uh, work with, um, in sustainability. He was the director of sustainability and I was the lower school sustainability coordinator. So I did sustainability initiatives with the really young kids, um, nursery through fourth grade. And I would say that really the most important thing is focusing on, um, focusing on what we can do and ways that we can be proactive rather than oh my goodness, this is what's happening, isn't that horrible, right? So 
um, really making the students feel like they have control, giving them um, specific bite-sized um, kind of uh, ways that they can be part of the solution and not the problem. And then also finding ways in the school setting um, to make sure that you're allowing them to um, do things that are positive for the environment so that they see that, you know, these positive things are happening and they're happening right here in our own community. Um, so just, you know, being, being really mindful about how you approach it with young students and trying to um, frame it in a positive way. I did want just, to say that, go ahead. Yeah, just to piggyback off of that, I, I think it's important also at the high school level that if you have a lot of students saying like, how can I change the world? How can I do this? And I really ask them, well, you can't do any of this until you can change yourself and you have to start with you and be the model for the community around you. So that gives them a directive to start working on something. I was just gonna jump on to what Juliet was talking about. Um, just before, just as the COVID shutdown hit, we were doing a fifth grade sort of mini mester on uh, water resources, freshwater resources, and had posed the question to the, the kids as, you know, what can our school or what can the fifth graders, what can you as a community do to address inequities in sharing that common resource? And so we'd split the girls up into, it's a girls' school, into different groups, looking at social justice, looking at engineering um, issues. And it was so fascinating watching them grapple with like these really, really big questions. But then the, I think the key in so many cases was really breaking it down into just what Juliet and Glenn were saying about, you know, into these like, A, what can you do? You know, like is like to like the point of like, well, you know, one girl's like, well, I have my water bottle. And it was like, you know, a Fiji water bottle, you know, that she was like reusing. It's like, okay, yeah. But like, let's dig into that a little bit more because somebody's pointed out, well, that was a Fiji water bottle. So it's just, um, it's just a great uh, reminder. Anyway. All right, Brian is back now. Uh, so welcome back, Brian. Thank you. Sorry, my computer went blank. Froze. Um, sorry, continue. I'm just, I don't know if I can You're share up, I and we're already put. No, go ahead. Continue talking. I'm trying to see if I can. My computer just trying to start back up. I don't know how to share from a phone. Yeah. If yeah, I don't know. How to, if you want to share, share your screen, is a little a little green uh, share screen down at the bottom of your screen. Yeah, I I just don't know how to do it from a phone. Ah. With my screen in terms well. So you'll have to talk it, I guess. I'm going to I'm going to jump back on I, my computer's up and running again. Sorry. Um, I think Chris Kennedy um, had to step away. Um, but I was I kept thinking about a way that he phrased um, his work and, you know, the work that you're doing with your students and creating what it means to create a comprehensive idea and understanding or not create or have students create that within themselves of, of climate change and of themselves within, you know, various overlapping ecosystems. Um, and, you know, how it's this multi-layered um, overlapping of data and their interaction with their environments and social justice, but also then it's that, you know, the emotional level and how to some degree that's kind of uh, an assessment. <laughs> so once you once you've fully understood it, you you know you really have to you you face what what Glenn's student faced. Um, so it's sort of like everything is sort of at least for me within this conversation, it's kind of like coming clarifying that and coming together. Uh, Brian is back. Maybe. <laughs> it's not letting him uh, 
come in here. Oh. There you go. It's like every class I've had for the past two months. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little too close to home. <laughs> right, right. Um, <clears throat> I. As Brian is trying to get back in. Um, I'm back now. I'm sorry. That's okay. That's totally fine. Uh, so should I go? I, I can try to fit it in. Two yeah. minutes. Sorry Perfect. about that. Let me. Uh, holy hell. Um, too many windows are open. We can also relate to that. So while I'm trying to do this, I can just explain uh, what Donna was saying before is I am uh, the director of sustainability at Poly Prep. Uh, so I look at nursery through 12th grade and my role is I, I do teach uh, two classes, but I also look at ways to provide different ways for other teachers to incorporate um, climate change or sustainability in general. Um, all right, let's see if that works. Can you see that? Okay. Uh, and so similar to what Glenn was getting at, um, looking at different ways to make that connection. Um, and so looking at the humanities piece, looking at uh, moving away from the hard science at times. Uh, this is a great quote that I love that really kind of echoes to kind of speaking more to teachers and saying, you know, is this what, re what you really want to teach? And if not, then let's try to work on that. Um, so like I said, I, I look at different ways to integrate the curriculum to campus and obviously in this case, the function of the school in terms of um, uh, online experience. Uh, and the best way to allow for that to happen is when those two connect, empowering students and faculty. Um, so what I really focus on is the idea of uh, really leaning on the United Nations, looking at the three E's of economy, uh, looking at equity, looking at the environment, and then also engagement. And you can see how the economy, which is usually the key piece that people tout as our current president in terms of uh, when to reopen the economy. And obviously that is nestled inside of how we interact with uh, uh, humans and society. And that's even, you know, fits in the larger uh, 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 shell of the environment. Uh, so I really lean on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. There are 17 of them uh, that really connects to all different facets of whichever discipline uh, of a teacher I'm, I'm talking to, as well as uh, um, whether we're looking at lower school, middle school, or high school. Uh, and this kind of breaks out into that idea of the three E's in regarding the, the various sustainable development goals and making those larger connections that Glenn was kind of uh, touching upon a little bit. Um, and one thing that really hits at, hits at home are, is uh, Johan Rockstrom's uh, Nine Planetary Boundaries and also Kay, uh, Ray Worth's uh, living within the safe and just space for humanity, or her famous uh, well paper was for Oxfam, but now uh, she has a book that, well, I guess it's a few years old now, but it's called Donut Economics, and it really focuses on the idea of finding that uh, the, the social foundation or floor in terms of trying to meet people's needs, but also the ecological ceiling and finding that uh, fine balance or that sustainable balance between the two. Um, and then one thing that I really like uh, looking at uh, as a resource too is Jamie Cloud's uh, Education for Sustainability. Uh, she's got a great website that fits uh, and really talks about the different ways that you can really make those connections and how climate change has this larger effect. Um, again, whether we're talking of within the science classroom, uh, arts, history, whatever it might be. Um, and then I, I always end with this quote because I, I love my, this quote. And also, she just turned 86 a couple weeks ago, and there's a new documentary that my family and I are going to watch about her on National Geographic. So uh, that's where I'll end, and hopefully that wasn't too much time, but um, thanks. 
Thank you, Brian. I'm glad that we that you made it back. Um, I I want to um, I want to go straight to the question that Chris Fresh added into the chat. Chris, do you want to um, read that out loud? Maybe everyone can. Maybe we can close on that. Um, Maybe I can go ahead and read it. Ooh, I'm muted. Oh, okay. still too close to home. All right. So, <laughs> so I was just thinking about the um, a lot of the examples and stuff. We've kind of gone from sort of the the microscopic scale of you know how do we do a lesson with something like this at different levels to sort of the macroscopic scale of how do we feel and how do we get get kind of tap into those emotions of students. Um, and I just thought it was kind of an inter interesting question maybe to, to pose to the group. Um, and so the question was, you know, we talk about the emotional investment and this sort of existential crisis that kind of comes along with learning about um, global climate change. And so how does, how does one, how do we as teachers provide opportunities for students to have that existential crisis? And then how as educators do we give them the tools to um, a, get them to realize that they are in fact in an existential crisis, like sort of that meta level, and also to act on said existential crisis. So to, to, to feel like they're empowered to do something about it um, and to be part of the actual uh, conversation, kind of like what Juliet was referencing uh, before with her fourth grade students. So I just thought that was a really interesting question to kind of frame to the group as we've kind of gone from little bite-sized lessons to sort of bigger with all the other folks talking about their curricula and things. I'd like to throw an idea out on that, if that's all right. Please go um, for it. Please, yeah. I, I don't think this just, this question isn't just posed for students, it also exists within adults as well and it exists across all continuums of learners and um, everybody has a different strategy and a different perspective and a different insight and a different attachment to their, their feelings. And I found the first thing I have to do is um, deconstruct their perception, understand it and validate it for where they are in that moment. And we as teachers do that daily on a million different interactions. Um, and I found once you've disabled or once you've deconstructed that a bit and reinforced that person for their understanding um then trying to disable their fear because change is scary for anybody and especially students especially when you're faced with such a such a mega problem like climate change there are so many factors and variables that, that contribute to that we often refer to it as a quote-unquote wicked problem um but deconstructing their fear to get them to take action or, or engage in learning and investigation about some a piece of it that they're passionate about and empower them to pursue that. I love that. I turning it into kind of a, you know, the fire that keeps you going to learn more and engage more and, you know, not just becoming literate about the data sets that you encounter, but, you know, participating and generating it and engaging. <clears throat> um, I, I'm looking at the time um, and as much as I feel like everyone who's in the room could probably go on for um, quite a bit longer. Um, I think that um, before I forget, I didn't want to just wrap it up. We did have a few announcements. Um, I don't know, Glenn, um, if you want to share, Glenn, press about consilience. Um, and we do have um, our own workshops that are coming up on uh, the SDGs and hydroponics at home. Um, uh, yeah, Chris, I'll go first on that if you don't mind. Um, so I've in the theme of bringing in the humanities in with all of the science piece pieces, uh, I thought it would be a good idea to start a, a reading club uh, that we're gonna call the Consilience Reading Club. Um, and we're trying to get that up and running on Sunday. 
and it'll be a lot of asynchronous work throughout the week. Well, not a lot of work, but it'll be asynchronous throughout the week. And then we'll try and get together once a week to kind of talk about how these two readings would interrelate. And am I correct in, in thinking that it's, it's integrated with the work that you're doing with your students now? Uh, yes, that is correct. So every reading that we'll look at is something that I have done with students. Um, so I have a lot of student answers as well. So you can see what a high school perspective on these relationships would be. And students are also welcome too, if you want to bring some kids into it. Awesome. That's great. Thank you, Glenn. Um, and um, I, I, I'm really, um, I was hoping, I think we were all hoping that kind of part of the STEM teachers NYC MO is to, you know, come together and inspire each other. And um, I think this was a, I think we managed to do that. Um, you want to plug the other two? Sure. Workshops coming up? Plug away. So uh, one really exciting one that's coming up next week. I think it's Wednesday, right? When the 29th is? Yes. Wednesday? Yes. Is, um, we're super excited. Neil Shubin, who, if you don't know who he is, he is an author. Uh, he's been on in documentaries, TV shows, award-winning paleontologist and evolutionary biologist. He is coming to talk. Um, that'll be from four to five, and he is coming to answer questions, talk about his research. Um, he just came out with a new book in March, so he will be open to talking about that. He said he's open to fielding any Q&A questions there are for folks. Um, so really, really exciting. It's open to teachers. It's open to their students. So, you know, definitely feel free to jump on. It's, it'll be a good time. Um, Juliet, did you want to talk about the hydroponics one? Um, yeah, so um, there are a couple of workshops. So Chris and I are in the process of planning a hydroponics workshop on um, how you can integrate hydroponics into your curriculum um, and specifically focusing on how you can do it um, without actually purchasing hydroponic systems. So things that you might already have um, around you um, and also how you can think about uh, how hydroponics can be a meaningful part of your curriculum. And we also, uh, Brian before had mentioned the Sustainable Development Goals, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And he and I, along with um, Kate McCauley, are in the process of planning a workshop where we will think of the Sustainable Development Goals as jumping off points for um, integrating climate science into your curriculum. So that is coming up as well. So just a few things in the pipeline. <laughs> just a couple. Just a couple. <laughs> so I think with that, um, I will say that this recording will be um, finding a home on our virtual resource page. And I think itself um, is a vast trove of resources and um, uh, inspiration. And I think what I might do is go back through the video and just kind of you know, do some minutes and highlights um, that folks can can also go through and link those. Um, beyond that, um, I want to wish everybody a happy Earth Day. Mind boggling having uh, hydroponics online. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make it work for Nan. I can <laughs> believe it. I, if anybody can, you and Juliet can. Yeah, making it happen. Awesome. Great work. Great work. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks, uh, Brian. Thanks, the whole crew. Really good. And I just want to say thank you for the invitation to join this meeting. I was, I, I, I mean this sincerely, I'm blown away by the, the work and the lessons and the activities that you've all created. It, it's some of the best teaching I've ever seen. And thank you, like, Matthew. Well, like you can do to help with your efforts. Please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I, I think you're all just Epically amazing teachers, and I'm honored to know you and be here tonight. My contact info is in the chat window if you want to copy the email. But wow, Keto we will definitely be before. stay in contact for sure. Awesome. Well, that's high praise from somebody who uh, who knows. Thank you. Awesome. Great. Thank you, everyone. Good to see you all. Good to see you all. Happy Earth Day.
Happy, Happy Earth, Earth Day. Day. Great, great Earth Day. Woo! Great Earth Day. Woo! Woo woo. <laughs> do I need to do anything? Do I need to pause, stop recording? Um, why don't you do yours first? Okay. I don't want to screw this up. Nope. <laughs>